Well, good morning, Southside. We're going to take back up in Romans this morning, so if you'll turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, we are looking at verses 3 through 8. We're in part 2 of 3. Uh, next week we will finish that up, Lord willing. So my prayer is that God would renew our minds in His church and how we are to live out our new life together in the gospel in the body of Christ. So let me read our passage before we do. I just want to remind you, <coughs> Christmas Eve service, we will be looking at John 3.16, just staring at the gospel, and want to encourage you. That these are at the information table when you come in. Invitations, just grab these, be evangelizing, hand these out to friends and family. This is an excellent time to be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. So do the work of an evangelist. I encourage you uh, in this. Romans 12, verse 3. Paul writes, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another." And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let our love be without hypocrisy. Let's pray to our God. Father, we come just so boldly this morning before your throne because of Jesus Christ who has done the work that has torn the veil in two so that we have bold access, loved, accepted children beseeching their Abba, their Father. And so Abba, we pray now that you would take these words and that we would understand them with our minds, that your spirit would teach us and that you would take them from our minds to our hearts, and that we would see the beauty of your design in the body of Christ, and that it would move to our will, and that we would use these gifts that you have given to us to build one another up into our head, and for you to get all the glory, that all who would see the beauty of what you're doing in our midst would say what an amazing God they serve, and that it, we would just be pointers to our glorious God. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, we are working our way through Romans chapter 12. And we began in Romans 12, 1, that this whole section is built on the therefore. The mercies of God in Christ Jesus are our motivations for all that we do now in all these exhortations that Paul is going to begin giving us in Romans 12 through 16. Because you are loved by God, you stand in His presence justified, righteous, accepted, adopted into His family. You now look and say, I just want to offer up my body a living sacrifice. Doing Romans 12 through 16 will never get you right with God. Because you're right with God through the work of Jesus Christ and faith in Him alone, now our hearts are new and we want to go live out these imperatives that we will come short till we get to glory, but our new heart desires and is seeking after them. So these, are, these imperatives are to, to take the new mind and the new heart and say, this is how God wants his children to live. And so we're, we're coming just bathed in Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness, saying, teach me how to live for you, your will, what is pleasing to you. And so we are called to live as mercied ones, showing forth mercy to one another. That's Romans 12 through 16. Chapter 12 is not a list of ways to live to get God to like us better or to accept us. It is how those who have been graced by God, loved in Christ, set free children, we go forth from the prison cell of sin, declared righteous, and this now is our spiritual worship to God. And we saw that in verse 2, we're not to be conformed to this world, 
but we're to be metamorphosed, to be transformed by knowing the will of God. What is he, how does he want us to live as his children? And the word is dokimos in the Greek. And so what we're doing is we're boiling off what was called adokimos, impurities. And, and so we, we, our former manner of life that we were in Adam, we were self willed. And now we're learning God's will. We're learning how to be pure and to, to live what he desires. That's what we're renewing. We looked at Romans 1 through 11 and we boiled off the impurity of our doctrine to, to look at the truth of the gospel and believe God's gospel. Now in chapter 12, we're boiling off the impurity of our practice, the, the things that we, we, don't, we don't understand. We weren't living as unbelievers. Now we're renewing our minds and so God, by the heat of your word this morning, boil off wrong practices toward the body of Christ this morning. My prayer is that as you see this word, he would boil off wrong thinking of how you are living in the body of Christ, which is his will. And to say, God, show me, teach me your ways, your purposes for how I should live in the body of Christ. So what is it? that the Lord wants from us his will. Well, generally stated, Romans 12, 1 through 2. And now we're moving into the more specific practice. In verse 3, 4, Paul's now going to show you now, here we have these principles of 1 through 2. Now I want to get specific. And what does that look like for these justified believers? What is, what is it that this consecrated life should look like? And he, he doesn't start with, here's how you should dress. Here's the music you should listen to. Here's the movies. Um, he, he deals with putting off sexual sin in chapter 13. Paul doesn't start there. And, and so you're just like, Paul, let's clean up the bride of Christ. But, but where he starts, his first interest is he directs us to his church for consecration. <clears throat> that is not the first issue that Paul will take up, all the things that get the float at the parade of sanctification. He starts first with the church. And he starts with, don't be conformed to this world. And when we were in the world, we were characterized by high-mindedness. No concern for other people, just ourselves. That's how we lived in this world. The mindset of this world is that we, we now want to bring that thinking into the body of Christ and maybe clean up some external things and say we're holy. But Paul's wanting us to renew our minds and our thinking right in the body. You want to use your members to serve God and other people? You start with the right thinking and heart toward the body of Christ that he has called you into. Your new family. There are ways that we are to think about this family. You are no longer the nation of Israel that was made up mostly of unbelievers. We're in the new covenant where he said, everyone in this covenant will know me. I'm going to write my law in your hearts. You're going to, you're going to know God. It's a regenerate membership. Everyone who's in the new covenant is a believer and made new. You're, you're baptized into Christ and thus baptized into the family of God, the church. And so you want to be holy. You want to be set apart for God. Start with serving your new family the way that God has designed it and fashioned the church to be. The church is an incubator of God's plan to birth and disciple and bring many sons and daughters to glory. It's his design, he said in Ephesians, to put on his manifold wisdom of, of, of himself, to put it on display, to show the world this God who's plucking out all nations and different people by this gospel. It's, even, uh, it's beautiful even with our brokenness, our remaining sin, our selfishness, our pride, to, to show forth God unifying a group like that with so many differences and nuances and faith and giftings by the Holy Spirit, it's just this beautiful design of God to put on display Him. And so we're going to dig deeper this morning in our understanding to renew our minds to true transformation. And not just play church. And just think of church as a building or a duty. We're plunging right into the middle of God's love and His design for the church this morning. And so we're going to look at our outline as Paul's going to give us three truths that we must understand to have proper body life, the church. Verse 3, we looked at two weeks ago, uh, the presupposition that we're to have. Verses 4 through 5, we'll look at this morning, the, the picture 
of the church. And then in verses 6 through 8, we'll look at the practice of the church. So verse 3, for through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. The first thing that changes when we are saved is how we think about God, Romans 12, 1 through 2, and then how we think about ourselves. And that has to change. This, This cannot be like when we were unbelievers where everything was about us. You lived that way all your life until God saved you. And, and, and don't just come in now and say, thank you, Lord. Now let me come into the body, my new family, and, and just live like I used to. It, it isn't, Southside is so lucky to have me. Here, here I am, guys. Make a big fuss over me. I can't believe that this local assembly, I visited 10 churches, you guys get me now. I read your doctrinal statement, and you guys could be the real deal. If you play your cards right, I might come here. You laugh, but I hear these things. It's not funny. (laughs) Maybe you have not that kind of thinking, but more in seed form. And Paul just wants us to check it at the door as we begin. And the first thing is these four words in verse 3, they were thinking words. You remember, they're, they're from the root phronane. And it's the mind, the mind function, the mind orientation, how we should think when we come in the body of Christ. And the first one, he says, don't have hooper phronane. And that hooper was to extend, to hyperextend. Don't think more of yourself than you should. The one thing about being a Christian now is I know who I am before God, that my thinking is right. So don't walk in the church thinking too much of yourself. Don't overthink yourself, but have sophronane when you come in. And it means to be of sound mind, reasonable, moderation, to keep one's head about him. It's, it's the opposite of pride. You come in with humility, but humility comes by having a right mind about you, to know who you are now before God and who he is. And, and so I am what I am by the grace of God alone. That's faith. That's right-mindedness in the body of Christ. So what is the fix for thinking too highly of yourself Well, last week, two weeks ago, we saw that it's faith. It's thinking highly of Christ is the cure. There's something better than you. There's something you can put your focus on and your adoration and your praise, and it's Him. I I just have this dream. Sometimes I I just, I want to preach my dream that 500 people walk in here every Sunday and, and all week just thinking highly of Jesus Christ. Thus highly of using the graces of God that he gave you gifts by faith to see him formed in everyone you come in contact with. I just want to use this grace gift to build up my brothers and sisters in Christ. I want to be used to increase faith this morning. And just thank you to the worship team as I just felt faith bubbling up in those songs and and the, the devotional at the Advent wreath and And our Sunday school group just so encouraged looking at how we know the Bible is the Word of God. And as we were sharing and interacting, faith was just building. Praying with my brother before coming up. And so I just pray that we would think much of Christ. Walk in and say, let's worship Him. Not who's going to notice me. Am I appreciated enough? Did, Did pastor walk by me and not say anything Yes. I am so nervous on Sundays. I hate public speaking. I get diarrhea every Sunday morning and I walk right by you because I'm scared to death. Okay? (laughs) Who's laughing at that, man? That's not... (laughs) This is where it starts to think soberly and rightly about this body. I want to bless you. To just so caught up in Christ and walk in and I just... It's about Christ and, and others and I just want to build them up. That would, what the freedom that that would bring into your life, I just want for you so badly. So that, how do we get that? Um, he said that each, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith, and this is all review, the, the way that we stay humble is we are reminded that any gift that you have was from God. It was grace, and it was for the good of the body. And that actually brings humility, because you can never think high of yourself. It's just 
Anything in this body that's beautiful was from God. And so it just makes us all on the same playing field and one and together with whatever grace gift God gives that we use them to build each other up. And that keeps us thinking rightly about each other and not puffing ourselves up and thinking too highly. Isn't that beautiful? Okay. I got an amen. I'm going to move on to the second point. <laughs> the picture. So that's our presupposition. And now this morning where we want to spend our time is the picture. And look, look at this picture now that Paul's going to paint. He's going to give more explanation with the four again. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And so Paul is now going to give us a picture to help us with the image of the church as the body of Christ. And this is not uncommon for Paul to do this. He said, we, there's an empire and we are the citizens. There's a building and he's the cornerstone and we're living stones in that building. There's a family and we're the household of God. There's a, there's a bride. There's the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians. And so we come now and he says, four. Paul is going to flush out a little further this idea of the individuality of our gifts that he mentioned at the end of verse 3. And he wants you now to realize you're unique and there is no one like you in the body of Christ. And sometimes that's hard to believe. And you're going to have to keep saying, God, renew my mind because I don't believe that. And God's word is saying it's true. You've been allotted a measure of faith and a gift to exercise that gift in the body. But I, I want you to get there's an individuality to it, but it makes up the corporate body of Christ. So all these individual people and gifts making up this body. And so you are a member by faith in Jesus Christ in his body. Though everyone's different, so much difference in here, and we make up the body of Christ. And it, this is big because it's not like a train. When you add cars every time a new person comes in. But what this is then is it's organic. It's a vital, living organism, the body of Christ, not a train. It's a body. The church is not a building. It's not a denomination. It's not where I tend. It's not a club that has the same doctrine and practices. It's not fancy facilities. It's not an organization where a pastor is a CEO it's those who have been called out of darkness unto His marvelous light, Jesus Christ, and by faith you're joined to Him and you get all of His benefits. You get His righteousness, His death, and your place. And you have a vital relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a Christian. By faith, I have been joined to Jesus Christ in this union of a relationship. And He's the head. He's my life my provider, my protector, my hope, my love, my treasure. And now we are the body of Christ. And we're given gifts to serve one another <coughs> that the body, Paul said, might grow up into its head. And so all these gifts work together to grow us up into Christ. That's amazing. And so right here is the assembling of the body of Christ, a band and brothers of sisters who've been made alive in Jesus Christ. Isn't that awesome? I hope you didn't just walk in just thinking this is some building and you come sing songs. I pray that you can get this vision for what God is doing to put on display his manifold wisdom. John Stott said, the church is a people, a community of people who owe their existence and their solidarity and their corporate distinctiveness from other communities to one thing only, the call of God, and the life of Christ. So what Paul is doing here is to get us away from always looking at ourselves. You don't exist only for yourself any longer. You're a part of something bigger than you. You are a part of the body of Christ by faith in Jesus Christ. And now let's take a look at that. As we look at this picture this morning, I want to bring to your attention three characteristics now of this picture. And in verse 4, he's going to show us unity. And then in verse 4b, he's going to show us the diversity. 
And then in verse 5, the, the codependency, the interdependence that we have with each other. So let's just take a look at those three and, and we will close in prayer. So some of you, you're, you're asleep earlier than normal. I want you to jostle somebody. Okay, this is beautiful stuff. I hope it will change your life like it's doing to mine. So wake up. You didn't even eat turkey this week and you're already out. So verse 4a. Four, just as we have many members in one body, one body, we are a body. And so there's the universal body of Christ over the whole world. But in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, Paul says there is a local assembly of this universal body, just a local church. And that's what Paul is addressing in this passage. And so it is to be applied to Southside. This is our local assembly. It's going right to you this morning. It's a fair application for us. And as there are many members, he says, in one body, the physical body, you got eyes, nose, arms, stomach, feet, toes, all the things that make up a body. Our bodies are not a collection of independent parts loosely attached together. They're not pinned on. It's a vital connection between the parts. They're they're all one, working together in perfect harmony. The body preaches amazing things as we keep learning more and more in science about it. The blood, the muscular, the nervous system, I, I geek out on that stuff, I love it. The heart and all that it goes out into one system and the nerves with these divisions that come back and the nerve center in the back and the brain, it's, it's all amazing. And so the body is more important than its parts. Uh, it just, you can't just say, I'm a finger. I'm a finger. It doesn't really matter. Well, what if you get an infection in that finger? It could go through your whole body and kill you. The whole body, is, it's, it's connected. It matters. It's such a good illustration. The body is one with separate parts that are vital and essential that make up the whole body. And Paul is now making the illustration saying that is the Christian church. We are a body. So never think of yourself as I'm adding myself to a church. Acts 2 said the Lord added to their number day by day. And so you can add people to your church and just become like a train Or you can see it as a a vital organism that I have been called into and it's just growing and it's vibrant and we're all interdependent. So God adds to his church in in an organic relationship, one body, the body of Christ. And I love that. We're the body of Christ. The unity of this body is in Christ. The gospel, the faith, the being joined to him, the oneness, that is what makes us the body of Christ of Christ. The unity of this body is in Jesus Christ. Each individual member in this body comes into a relationship by grace through faith in Christ alone. And so you're joined into Christ. And now there's this organic body that we all have that faith and we are joined to him. It's unbelievable what is represented here this morning. And when you do, you come into a relationship with everyone who's come into a relationship with Jesus Christ. I love meeting believers every day. It's my family. It's like a family reunion everywhere I go. It's beautiful. We're one body. I am Jesus' brother. You are Jesus' sister. And and thus, uh, we're sisters and brothers. And I wonder what that would do with some of our hurts and pulling away and not liking or talking to someone who's difficult, whatever it is, um, this should be the cure for that. So to renew your mind, the, the way the world thinks about people is not how we think. And we have a whole new way of realizing we're brothers and sisters, and we are in Jesus Christ. So we are justified together. We stand in the de- declaration by faith this morning, righteous. We're sanctified together. We're adopted together. We belong to the family of God. We are loved together by God. And you have to get this because what it could do for not liking someone or even in your own marriage, whatever it would be, this is the healing place. This is the cure. And so catch this for sure. Our unity is in Christ and we have every spiritual blessing together 
in him. Our unity is huge. And so to treat this lightly is the shame of our day and age. And I, I just was thinking through this week, what if I'm divisive in the body? And Paul wrote to Titus, he said, warn a divisive man. And then give him a second warning, and if he doesn't, have nothing to do with him. Put him out. So do you see what Paul's saying? If there's a cancer in the body, cut it out. Do you see how important the unity is to him? So to just examine my own heart, to, to bring disunity into his body that he purchased unity is a big deal. I just want you to catch, capture that with me because it's not respected the way it should in our day and age. We're so individualistic in our thinking instead of this beautiful body. Listen to a few verses, 1 Corinthians 12, 3. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jew or Greek, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 24 later, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, <coughs> that there should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. We'll see that later in Romans 12. And then Ephesians 4, Paul said, I, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling by which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness and patience, <coughs> Excuse me, showing forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Be diligent to preserve what God has made, to put his name on display, to show him forth. What unity there is to our physical bodies when it's all working together in a vital way. And so the body of Christ needs this unity. We all serve the body of Christ with our gifting, and it's just an every member ministry where everybody's using their gifts to grow each other up into the head. It's the only kind of church that the Bible knows of is serving one another, but it's not the American church. So what do we got to do? Renew our minds to what the will of God is, not to what America has taught us. And so I got to begin to think his thoughts toward the body of Christ. So in this body, there is a unity that has been purchased at the cross that you don't make, you can't create it. And then secondly, there is also a diversity. There's a diversity in verse 4. For just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function. So we have this one body made up of great diversity, just like a human body. Have you ever seen those bumper stickers, celebrate diversity? I'm always like, I do. <laughs> I love it. I don't think we mean the same thing, but I love the diversity at Southside Bible Church. It's beautiful. It's so diverse that the Lord has made us one body. And Peter says, as each one has received a special gift, employ it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. We stewardship these gifts that God has given to us. <clears throat> so we must have diversity. <clears throat> when you go to the zoo, I just love all the different animals. And God works that way in nature, and he does the same thing in church. Just all the diversity. He, he, he delights in it. It's his glory. And so not every church member should be the same. And when they are, what do we call that? A cult. <laughs> a cult is you got to dress this way, look this way, talk this way, and, and don't get haughty because Reformed Christians do the same thing. You got to speak this way. You got to say these words. You got to raise your kids this way. We try to get conformity where everybody's the same. And, and God doesn't do it that way. Unity does not mean uniformity. We're all so different. I love it. Uh, just, I was just thinking about our elder board. It, it's just beautiful, all the difference. And, and in this body, we're all puzzle pieces to make a portrait of Jesus Christ. Every puzzle piece matters. Does the diversity throw you for a loop? 
<laughs> Why isn't everybody like me? I hear that. It's, yeah, good. Everybody shouldn't be like you. That's the beautiful thing. And it's amazing for God then to put such diversity into a body and find unity because this world, whenever it looks for unity, it tries to bring uniformity. It's just nowhere do you just get everyone being different and, and being together as one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one hope. It, just, it's, it exists nowhere but here. And that's why we have an opportunity to put God on display like nowhere else in this world. Your gift is essential. Have you ever finished a puzzle and there was a piece missing? And it wasn't your little brother who stole it so he could put the last one in? I hated that. It ruins the whole thing. It just ruins the whole thing. Because every other piece is doing exactly what it was supposed to do. Good job, piece. Good job. They're just, they're functioning right. And this one piece that's missing ruins the whole portrait. All have a function. Again, there's no spare parts in the kingdom of God. So do you see it's bigger than just going to church? You've been saved to be a puzzle piece in the body of Christ to minister the gift that God's given you to the saints of God to grow them up into the head. And we're going to flesh that out a little more next week. But I want you to renew your minds and don't fight this. Okay, don't fight it with American Christianity or just what you're used to. Look at God's will. You've been mercied in Jesus Christ. You're, you're born again. You're justified. How do I live in the body of Christ this way? bigger than just going to church. So the conclusion is we have variety and unity. Isn't that beautiful? Variety and unity. And I want to close out with dependency in verse 5. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And so we're linked. We're, we're tied together. And so this is not independence it's interdependence is what he's talking about. Listen to Ephesians 4, 15. Truthing in love, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in all aspects into him who's the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for it's building itself up in love. We're going to cause each other to grow up in our agape for God and for others. All of us working together with our gifts. Isn't that beautiful what this is going to produce? This body is going to grow through the proper usage of all of its members. Each part working rightly by the grace of God, we will grow up into the head. The body causes the growth of the body. We have a dependent interest in one another's Gifts. Body parts don't exist and function alone. Who cares if you're a heart or a tongue without being attached to a body? I don't care about a heart sitting over there or a tongue over there. It does no good. In fact, if they're, if they're that way, they're going to die. I was thinking about perfect health. It's when you forget about all your body parts. Just perfect health, nothing's hurting. And so you don't even think about it. They're just all, everything's working together in harmony. The 1689 London Confession says, being united together in love, we have communion in each other's gifts and graces. We have communion in each other's gifts and graces. That's our bond, our fellowship. Your gifts and graces are for the common good of the brotherhood. You've received these things for believers. It's a simple principle. They're not for you. High-mindedness is that they're for you. Corinth, they were fighting over who could get the showy gifts because they were for them. What would get them recognized? The sin of that thought. He said, love is the greatest gift. Consecrate yourself for the body of Christ. And sanctification is to take place in the church by design. The hurts that you will face, 
when you're slighted, the insecurities that spring up, the forgiveness that needs to be given, the encouragement that you will receive, the kindness expressed, the gifts that will be used. That is the design of God to grow us up. It's not the importance of our position and function. Whatever our position is, it's given to us by God. It's vital, it's important, and it's essential to the working of the whole body of Christ. So don't let there be pride and envy and despising because God chose it this way. And anything we have is a gift from Him for the good of this body. Isn't it? You can forget yourself so easy. The proper working of each individual part, that's how grace will flow and bring about our growth in Jesus Christ. And we all know what cancer is. And the cancer is when something within our own body starts to betray the body and turn against it. And so we, we pray, God, don't let me be cancer in the body of Christ. Will you spend your days judging the church, looking for heaven here, or will you lock shields with all of our differences in unity for the grace of God to flow into our lives? It's an important question that needs to be answered by the therefore. Having been justified by faith in Christ Jesus, will I give myself to that? So we need to have, it says, sober thinking. Gifts from God that are not for us. They're for others. And to do some real sober examination where the Lord has gifted you, um, is it hyper? Are you thinking too much of yourself or are you thinking too little where you're not using your gift? It's for the building up of the body of Christ. The sovereignty of the Holy Spirit equips us each individually in the body of Christ where there's great diversity. We're all dependent on each other to use our gifts and together we'll be a full piece orchestra that will make the most beautiful melody of God's grace to this world. To adorn us as we wait anxiously for our bridegroom to come back. So as we close, this text is telling us that our individuality is discovered and experienced in relationship to the body. So we're, we're dependent on one another. So to, to find out who you are and where you're gifted and all of those things, it's it happens here. We are members, he says, of one another. We're members of each other. It's not just a big body. You are a member of me and I'm a member of you. I love that. We're interconnected. God made it that way. If you don't like it, you're, you're not going to like heaven. So just, we, we're interconnected. I'm part of you. You're part of me. Just catch that. What this could do in our midst. I want to individually bless you. You're, you're part of me and I'm a part of you. Move out to others in love. And as you do, you're, you're going to figure out who you are. This is, you know, I have people say, I'm going to go away for a year to figure out who I am. And they always come back and don't know who they are. <laughs> we find out who we are interconnected, living together, sinning against each other. <laughs> Everything that comes, this is, this is where I find out who I am. And so this is beautiful. We're, we're dependent on each other. We're interdependent in the body of Christ. Closing. I just, first, the application next week. As he's going to say, then, then practice these gifts. He's just going to say, if God's given them to you by grace through faith, use them. Use them. And it's his grace doing it so it isn't, oh, I can't, I don't know how. It's His grace and by faith, I, I'm believing this gospel and I'm living into it and I'm just entering into this body by grace through faith to help it in any way that I can. Use these gifts because you stand justified before God through the work of Jesus Christ. What a bond we have. I was thinking of marriage. You have diversity for sure. That's one of the harder things is that in, in, in Genesis 2, he says, I'm going to make someone for you, Adam, who's like different. So th this person you marry is like you, but different. And now you're going to be joined together in a covenant. 
and, and it doesn't always go well. And those differences were designed by God to help you become more like Jesus Christ. And so when you're mad at your differences, who are you really mad at? You're, you're mad at God who handpicked your spouse perfectly with, with her differences to make us more like Jesus Christ. And so in the body, to despise our differences and get frustrated when they were given to make us like Jesus Christ, to be made more like him. Some of the people who annoy you the most were God's gift to make you the most like Jesus Christ, not to write them off. So it's so big. So that's free marriage counseling if anybody wants it. Um, number three, children. I really teach them not just by words, but by actions. I think the best thing you can give to your children is a high view of the body of Christ. The, the kids are fleeing the church today left and right. And I think it's because we're, we're losing the gospel. And I think it's because they don't have a high view of what this is. And so stay away from it. Slander it. Remind them how bad everybody is. Gossip about everybody. Just teach your kids a low view of the church. And it, it kills them. And the kids that I've watched through the... It's good being a pastor for 24 years of the same church. And, and the ones who have done well were those that had a high view of the bride of Christ. And so I just encourage you parents to, to model this beautiful thing that we've just looked at to your children, that they love the bride of Christ. That it isn't the, a horrible place where everybody's mean. Man, this is, I, I've told this before, but I said to my kids, you don't have to go to church here anymore. You're, you're grown up, pick wherever you want to go. That's my family, why would I leave? Because you've loved them and you've adorned Christ. And they're like, well, I don't want to leave this. Beautiful. Fourth, I think we should examine to renew our minds of how am I thinking about the body of Christ and to repent before God to say, I've been thinking like I did when I was in the world about the body of Christ. I've brought worldly thinking in here and that's killing me. And I, I just want to repent, change my thinking about the body of Christ and God's design and turn from it and you'll find times of refreshing and washing and forgiveness because of the work of Jesus Christ. So just confess it. Be forgiven. Get restored and empowered to come think and live different in the body of Christ. Amen? Number five, what do you, what do, you do when you find weakness or sin in the church? It's just a big question because until glory, you'll find it, right? You don't even have to look very hard. What do you do when you find it? And so what Paul said is to be forgiving, forbearing, humble, and love one another when you see it. Because there's something bigger than your frustration, your hurt, your annoyance. It's this unity that we put on display to the world with all of our differences. So every time you let love cover a multitude of sin, it's so beautiful what you're showing the world. And in our day and age, nobody does that. And to be the body of Christ, doing that with each other week in and week out, they're going to ask you, what is the hope within you? I'm getting asked that a lot. Visitors coming saying, what's going on here? The love that's flowing in this place is unbelievable. And so you're, you're, putting, you're making him look great. And people want that. I love it. Number six, unity then is not just going to church. It's being in Christ that we now have a, a, a special bond and family and, and oneness. It is that vital relationship with Jesus Christ. So the result is there is only one body of Christ. All true believers are members of this one body. And there's a unity that should be visible. <clears throat> and we should be greatly concerned about our unity of putting on display God. Romans 12 is telling us that the character of unity is a spiritual unity. Unity cannot be produced by men, only by Christ and the Holy Spirit. Men can never produce this. The Bible never calls us to produce this unity just to maintain it. And so we maintain that. We're diligent about it. And it's being in Christ that brings this unity. 
And unity is a creative work of the Holy Spirit where we can join all the churches we want to, but we cannot make us a part of the body of Christ that only comes through this beautiful work of the Holy Spirit. And, and lastly, if you've been in churches and just going around or you're just here maybe for the first time, well, what you need then is to be joined to Jesus Christ because you can't function this way or be this way. I guarantee you, your, your life has a lot of broken relationships in it. And Christ has come to restore. The reason you have broken relationships is the most important relationship was broken by Adam in a garden and it separated us from our Creator. So we were made for God. And because of that separation now, the, the heart is restless and it's trying to find what, what, what we find in God and everything other than God. And we just keep chasing and looking for it. And it's Solomon said it's like chasing the wind. Every time you think it's going to make you happy, it never does. And so what you're lacking is you need to be brought back into a relationship with God. And so Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born into this world in a virgin's womb. And he came in to bring about this healing and restoration and bringing you back to God. And Jesus came and he lived the life that God required of each one of us because none of us could do it. God demands a perfect righteousness if you'll ever be in his presence. So if you keep trying to do that, you'll always come short. Well, God's son came in the world and he didn't come short. He said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. And he fulfilled it in every jot and tittle. He perfectly loved God with his heart, mind, soul, and strength and his neighbors himself. And the gospel is God will treat you as if you lived that life. And then for every sin you ever committed, it says the soul that sins must die. You can't come back into a relationship until God's justice is satisfied to punish your sins. And he put his own son up on a cross and he pulled out the sword of justice and he didn't spare his own son. And, and for those three hours on the cross, he poured out his full wrath against every sin that we ever committed so that now he could forgive you of every sin that you've ever done. And the beautiful news of the gospel is, is I, I, when I first heard that, I said I would walk to New York on my hands if I could have this gift. And then I realized that the gift is you bring nothing. See, man will do anything to have this gift except nothing. And we come poor in spirit with nothing to offer, not your goodness, not your resolutions, not cleaning yourself up. You come with nothing. And you believe in Jesus Christ, what he has done to bring about your salvation. And God will give you the free gift of God, eternal life and relationship with him. And that's how you're brought into the church of God. And so I pray that you, you if, if you've always felt outside the church, there's a reason. And it's the gospel that brings you into your family. And I've just, I've met people where you, you've, you've never felt at home in the body of Christ. And maybe it's because you've never been at home with Jesus Christ. And so I, I pray if that's your condition this morning, that you would come to Jesus Christ and believe in him and be saved and be joined to Jesus. And now these are your brothers and sisters. And it's just every Sunday is a family reunion. Just, these are the people you love and we, our gifts sharpen and grow and help each other. And it's not me sitting on the outside watching everybody else know Jesus. So he, he bids you to come in, be made right with God, and now you have a forever family and you'll belong because we'll have one faith, one Lord, one hope, one calling, one baptism. And that's what binds us together. And if you don't have that, you'll always feel on the outside all of your days. So what, what you need is not a nicer church. You need a savior. And he wants you to come to him that you might have life and have this blessing. So I offer you the most beautiful thing in the world, the Lord Jesus Christ for the healing of your soul this morning. Don't let 40 years of religion get in the way. Come to Jesus if that's what you've lacked your whole life and he will give you eternal life and salvation. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this beautiful Christ. I thank you for the church that you are building. Thank you that you made us living stones in the temple of God because we came to the one who gives life. We thank you that you have given us our individuality, Lord, that we have different gifts, different abilities, different um, uses, and, and yet you've made us one. We, we are the biggest, best team ever united. What a family. 
And so thank you for the oneness that we have and the difference. And I thank you that you made us interdependent. There's no Lone Rangers. You can't go and do this on your own. I love that you made it in this body is where we're going to grow. And so I pray that all these gifts would cause the body to grow up into the head, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God, we do, we come before you with wrong thinking. And we ask that you forgive us for thinking wrongly about the body of Christ. Lord, wash us clean in the blood of the lamb who was shed, who gave his life for this bride. Oh, thank you that when we have not treasured his bride, he still loves us and will forgive us and wash us and teach us and keep renewing our mind and changing us. God, we thank you for this beautiful gift of Jesus Christ. God, thank you for this family. I love them with all my heart. And I thank you that we can, we can be one and we can labor together to make much of Jesus Christ and to help each and every one of us breathe our last breath, holding to Jesus Christ to have that eternal reward with him forever. God, renew our, our commitment as we stare at this gospel again. And we thank you. And it's in that precious name that we do pray. Amen.